right, we are started. Okay, so you wish me to just begin, I suppose that's the idea. Then uh, thank you. It was um, First of all, let me say um, hello to everyone. Uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all today to the virtual visit of Google at the Technical University of Munich, or TUM. My name is Gerhard Kramer, and I am the Senior Vice President of Research and Innovation at TUM. We're glad that you could join us here today, where we wish to highlight the past present and future collaborations between our university and Google, one of TOM's partners of excellence. Over the past seven years, Google and TOM have collaborated on more than 30 projects on topics ranging from visual computing, 3D reconstruction, robotics, countering browser hacking, all the way to quantum information processing. One of the goals of today's event, among others, is to add more topics to these. A particularly warm welcome to our Google guests in Mountain View, California. Thank you for joining us so early in your day. Among these guests are Jeff Dean, Senior Vice President of Google Research and Google Health, and Royal Hansen. Google Global Vice President Engineering of Privacy, Safety, and Security. We will hear more about them and from them shortly. We also have Wieland Olfelder here, who is Vice President of Engineering and Site Lead of Google Munich. Welcome also to everyone joining us from TUM, particularly Professors Claudia Eckert, Stefan Gunemann and Nasia Nawab, who will be presenting, and Antoine Leboyer from the new TUM Venture Lab for Software and Artificial Intelligence. And of course, welcome to all the TUM students attending. You are the ones we are all most interested in promoting and supporting. And you can play a central role in shaping today's event by actively participating. Please be prepared to ask questions of the presenters. A final welcome and thank you to the organizers of the event, in particular to Marco Loza and Francesca Cowley from Google. To anyone else who might be watching, we hope that you find the ideas, questions, and discussions stimulating as a foundation for future projects. We strongly encourage you to reach out to each other during and after today's event to share your plans. And the organizing team will be happy to connect you so you can simply connect with them in case you have um, ideas, wishes, or the need for contacts. So that's all I really wanted to say to start this event. Next, the video team has put together a short trailer which highlights some of the work that is already being done between TUM and Google in Munich. Enjoy the event. Hello and welcome to Google's virtual visit to the Technical University of Munich. Today, we'll be focusing on our past, present, and especially future collaboration between TU Munich and Google. We've worked as collaborative partners for many years on projects in several fields, including augmented reality. In 2018, Google became a partner of excellence for TU Munich. A special highlight today, Google at TUM. Former university president Wolfgang Hermann remarked back then that the TU mission was to think far into the future and to shape technological change. Shaping technological change is, of course, an endeavor that Google knows a thing or two about. A close partnership between the two was therefore a natural fit. Today, we collaborate across a wide range of fields, 
including machine learning, computer vision, quantum computing, and security and privacy. Within these fields, our collaboration takes many shapes and forms. On one hand, we have collaborative research projects allowing us to focus on the complex issues of modern technology and its use. These include quantum computing and simulations, as well as computer vision and pattern recognition. Inspired by today's event, we're looking forward to many more joint projects and closer collaboration in the future, including in the area of computer-aided medical procedures. Other initiatives include the Google Developer Student Club, which is being locally sponsored by Google. It's open to participation for any student interested in developer technologies. With Google expanding their presence and activities here in Munich, for example with the Arnold Post Project and the Google Safety Engineering Center, and with TU Munich's new initiatives including the Munich Data Science Institute, there are doubtless many new opportunities for future cooperation. At today's event, we hope to encourage and build a stronger foundation for collaboration between Google and TU Munich in all fields, and together with people interested in supporting the important work ahead. We're excited to welcome all of you to our virtual visit and the inspiring exchange of ideas. Wow, what, what a great video. Thanks so much to the to media team. This turned out to re, be really exciting and shows some of the highlights of our past um, collaboration. So hello and welcome also from my side to the virtual Google at TUM visit. Great to have you all and thanks for joining. My name is Wieland Holfelder. I joined Google almost 14 years ago and I'm a VP of engineering and the site lead for the Google Engineering Center here in Munich. First of all, I'd like to thank Professor Kramer for the kind introduction and the entire team at TU Munich for having us today for this virtual visit. And also a big thanks to all of my colleagues at Google to make this event possible. And maybe just a few quick words about the Google Engineering Center here in Munich. We're calling Munich home since 2006 and we're the largest of four Google offices in Germany and the largest Google Engineering Center in the EU. Most of the 1,600 Googlers in Munich are working on engineering and product management for various exciting products and topic areas, including privacy, security, the Google account, Chrome, Google Cloud, Google Shopping, programming languages, internal tools, just to name a few. And we are also the home of the Google Safety Engineering Center, or GSEC, as we also like to call it. And of course, we keep growing. So if you're interested in a software engineering career at Google, please do reach out. Okay, enough um, advertisement for today. I don't want to use up more time because we have two very exciting keynote speakers from Google today. And then we also will have a session where we will answer your questions. So it's now my honor and pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Jeff Dean, who is our first keynote speaker today. Jeff joined Google in 1999 as Google employee number 30. He's a Google senior fellow leading Google research and Google health. And um, these organizations focus on basic computer science and machine learning research and on the application of this research to important problems. Jeff's industry leading work has been integral to many generations of Google's search engine, our initial ad serving system, our distributed computing infrastructure, including Bigtable and MapReduce. Some of you may, may know these technologies, the TensorFlow open source machine learning system and many libraries and developer tools. So it's a great pleasure to have you, Jeff, and uh, over to you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity to virtually visit uh, Munich. Um, and uh, I'm going to be talking today about five exciting trends in machine learning. And this is presenting the work of many, many people at Google. Um, I think one of the things that we should all take stock of is that in the last decade, Computers have really gone from not being able to understand perceptual inputs or language very well to making you know, tremendous progress on being able to actually understand 
what is in images to understand, you know, audio waveforms and do much better speech recognition to be able to translate languages from one uh, human language to another much more effectively. And a lot of this is driven by machine learning. Uh, next, please. Next slide. There we go. Uh, so if you think about uh, the improvements in quality in the last decade or so, uh, there's a Stanford contest that's run every year uh, to classify pixels of an image into one of a thousand different categories. And in uh, 2011, the sort of top one accuracy of this was just a little bit above 50%. Um, in 2012, uh, AlexNet, which was uh, uh, done at the first use of a deep neural network for uh, this, this particular contest, uh, done by uh, Alex Krzyzewski, uh, Ilya Sutskever, and Jeffrey Hinton, made a huge leap in accuracy in the system. That was the only uh, entrant that year that used a deep learning-based neural network approach for the contest. Um, but the, the change that that portended was really, really amazing. The next year, something like 28 of 29 entrants all used deep neural networks in order to do computer vision. And you've seen tremendous progress since then on improving the accuracy to uh, above 90% now. So uh, computers can now actually see, which is a pretty pretty amazing thing. Um, next slide. They can also understand speech much better. So the word error rate on uh, speech recognition benchmark has dropped you know, from a little above 13% down to 2.5% over the last five or six years. Uh, next slide. And I won't talk through all of this uh, next, but we've seen you know, substantial improvements across nearly every benchmark in natural language understanding and machine translation. Uh, up and to the right on these little graphs is, is good, and you generally see an up and to the right trend. Um, next slide. So what I wanna to talk to you today about is five exciting trends uh, in machine learning listed here. Um, and let's just dive right in. Uh, next slide. So the first couple are more capable general purpose machine learning models, which is a trend that we've seen uh, quite a lot of in the last few years, and also major improvements in the efficiency of ML models of hardware. Next. So one of the things that has happened is that uh, we've seen that as you scale up these models and train them on more data uh, and use larger models in order to, to sort of absorb the knowledge in those data sets, um, we've really seen that you want much more computational power. And in particular, you want very specialized kinds of computational power in order to uh, sort of apply the sort of uh, subset of uh, operations that are present in most deep learning algorithms, sort of linear, accelerated linear algebra, matrix operations, vector operations are really the kinds of things we want to accelerate. And we don't have as much need for general purpose uh, computation devices. We can specialize them for these things. Uh, next. And so we've been focused on building out specialized hardware uh, tailored to machine learning uh, for the last, you know, seven or eight years. Um, these are our tensor processing unit uh, chip family um, with the first one in the upper left there, which was uh, really targeted for inference only when you already have a trained model and you just want to sort of apply it on image or speech data, other kinds of things. Uh, and then the subsequent ones are really targeted at both inference and training. And you see there's been pretty substantial improvements from TPU v2, which gave about 45 teraflops per chip, to the most recent TPU v4, 275 teraflops per chip. Next slide. <clears throat> um, and those chips are designed to be connected in together into larger configurations that we call pods. So they have very high speed networking between uh, the chips and the pod sizes have been increasing from 256 chips to the most recent TPU v4 pod, which gives about 1.1 exaflops of compute uh, and 4,096 chips kind of all connected together with these very high speed uh, network links. Uh, v3 and v4 are liquid cooled, so it's always very exciting when you pipe water onto the surface of your chips. Uh, you have to be pretty careful, uh, but uh, these are really kind of uh, core building blocks for us being able to train large and effective um, neural network models. Next. And many advances in this space. Next. 
And many advances in this space uh, depend on being able to understand text. You know, text and language are a very natural way of communicating. And there's been recent pretty encouraging improvements in language understanding as these models have scaled up. Next. Um, so in 2017, a team of Google researchers uh, plus an intern uh, introduced the transformer model uh, in a paper uh, called Attention is All You Need. Next. Um, and this paper actually was number four on the Nature Journal's 2020 list of most influential scientific papers between 2015 and 2020. Um, as, as an aside of how much uh, machine learning is sweeping, not just computer science and AI, but many other fields, the first non-machine learning paper on that list is number five. So the top four were all machine learning related papers. Next. And these large transformer-based language models uh, can actually generate surprisingly coherent conversations. And so I'll give you an example of that next. Um, so one of the things that's pretty interesting is you can prompt these models and you can say, give it an input saying, hi, I'm a Weddell seal. Do you have any questions for me? And there's a Weddell seal in the upper right. It's a particular species of seal. And then the model kind of will use that context and carry on a conversation starting with the premise that it is a Weddell seal. Uh, next. And so you can see, you know, what does a seal do to keep busy? The human who's uh, interacting with this chat system uh, asked, and the system responded, you know, eat fish, bask in the sun to help keep warm, hunt penguins, play with the other seal pups, and swim for fun. Uh, great. Okay, so next. You know, how do you cook the fish? We don't cook the fish. We eat it raw, but you could pick up a parasite. Yeah, sometimes we do. Luckily, we could survive. And you can see this is a fairly coherent, long, longer, longish conversation where the system is actually able to maintain uh, the illusion that it is uh, responding as if a Weddell seal was, was talking to you. You can see this to be useful for educational purposes and, and things like that. Next slide. And it kind of goes on and on, you know, um, discussing hunting and uh, uh, the seal, seal coat. Um, next. Um, so more recently, we've been working on scaling up these, these language models. So in the last few weeks, we've released a paper about uh, a pathways language model uh, called Palm. Uh, and this is a, essentially a model that's been trained on just lots of text. Uh, and it's trained to predict the next word from the preceding words. Um, and it's a 540 billion parameter language model. It's trained on two of those pods uh, for about six, six weeks. Um, it's the largest dense language model trained to date. Um, next. And the system actually has, you know, pretty interesting capabilities. So it can explain jokes. So here's a joke, you know, it, the system was actually trained on two different TPU v4 pods. Uh, so did you see that Google just hired an eloquent whale for their TPU team and showed them how to communicate between two different pods? Next. And the system responds with, you know, why, why is this a joke? TPUs are a type of computer chip. A pod is a group of TPUs, but it's also a group of whales. The joke is the whale is able to communicate between two groups of whales. Um, so it sort of understands the dual meaning of pod and understands what TPUs are and can kind of give you an insight into why this might be amusing to a human. Uh, next. And here are some other just uh, simple examples of uh, this, you know, as, as students, you all know that you get A's on tests because you study hard, not the reverse. Um, you know, it can understand emojis. Um, it can uh, do a few other things. And remember, the system was never trained to do these tasks it's being asked to do, you know, try to identify the two words best associated with the word. It simply got a lot of not world knowledge from inter uh, interpreting and seeing lots of text. And so it can answer questions like this uh, in a pretty interesting way. Next. And it gives state-of-the-art performance on many tasks. So the, the blue lines here are the Palm model uh, with zero shot, one shot, and five shot uh, uh, performance on a, on a range of uh, natural language processing tasks. And when I say one zero shot, I mean the system is just given a description of the task and no other information, and then is asked to solve a question for that task. With one shot, the system is given the description of the task and one example of an input and an output, and then is asked to solve a different problem in that same task. 
And then with five shots, the system gets to see five examples of inputs and outputs and then is asked to solve a, a new one. Um, and uh, the, the lower dotted line there is average human performance on these tasks. And the upper dotted line is the performance of the best human uh, in, in a data set uh, on, on those tasks. Um, next. And so the this Palm model actually exceeds the state of the art on a, a wide number of the 58 tasks that are in common with previous work. Uh, that were uh, and uh, next slide. And it also, as, as I said earlier, exceeds the average human performance on on uh, the majority of these tasks. Next. And so where are we headed? You know, we'd like to have, actually, instead of having separate models for different tasks, as is sort of the common practice of machine learning today, we'd like to actually train a single model that can generalize across all the different tasks we want a machine learning model to perform. So uh, that's one trend that I think uh, will accelerate in the next few years. Next. Although the Palm model is a dense model where kind of the entire model is activated for any given example or, or task, um, we actually think that in the future, sparse models are going to sort of uh, take over from that. We've done some experimentation and re early research on sparse models where in, you have a very large model, but you only activate a small portion of the model for any given example or task, sort of like having different areas of specialized knowledge in, in your own brain that are activated when you're thinking about different kinds of things. Next. And then, you know, the common practice today is we train single modality models. So a model that understands, you know, textual inputs is maybe a different model than one that, that deals with visual inputs that is different than deals with speech inputs. But we like models that deal with all these modalities that can flexibly take in uh, inputs in any of those forms and, and ideally produce outputs in any of those forms. So it could take in text and produce images, could take in images and, you know, give you textual descriptions of those images or videos. Um, we think that's kind of, uh, these three things are really trends that are going to be important in the future. Next. Um, another area that's exciting is uh, many of the uh, kind of advances in, in the research space here have, have made their way into Google products and in particular into kind of the personal computing devices that we all carry around with us every day. Um, so next. Um, so by being able to better understand what is in images, uh, we actually can create these uh, really amazing uh, camera experiences on these devices um, where we can, for example, integrate many different actual sensor uh, inputs uh, to do things like photograph things in very low light for astrophotography or you know, uh, blur the background like a professional photographer might. Uh, using uh, sort of uh, analysis of what's in the foreground and the, in the background, um, things like that. Next. Uh, we also can analyze what's in there. So if you've been on vacation and you've taken a beautiful picture of this landscape, but there's these annoying telephone poles there, uh, you can actually just point at them and say, please erase them. Or the people in front of your waterfall photo can be, you know, not there if you prefer. Um, next. And there's a whole bunch of features on the device that depend on understanding speech, um, uh, understanding language, being able to sort of generate speech and interact with, with other uh, entities. And, and that's pretty important. Uh, if we look at Lens Read Aloud, for example, it allows the system to read uh, text that is in the camera viewfinder aloud to, to a user. Next. And this is actually quite useful in, in many environments, uh, in particular uh, in areas where um, maybe uh, users don't understand the, the language or they're, they're not able to read and write, but they can actually point at an object and have the system read the, the uh, text that they uh, see to them. Next. And there's also been growing impact as machine learning is used in more fields of engineering and science. Next. Um, and so computer vision and machine learning can really advance uh, these fields, and we're seeing that in, in many uh, different areas. Next. So I'll just touch on a couple. So one is um, weather forecasting. Uh, traditional weather forecasting methods use kind of uh, 
uh, very mathematically intensive physics uh, simulation uh, physics uh, simulations on supercomputers in order to come up with a forecast. Um, and we wanted to ask the question of could we learn the physics instead of hand coding it in a bunch of rules uh, next? And so could we take in observations about the world, you know, things like satellite imagery, uh, you know, barometric pressure observations and so on, and then come up with a forecast through machine learning based methods. Next. And it'd be nice if we could do this quickly because the traditional approach of, of numerically intensive simulations takes actually hours to produce a forecast. And if we could take in observations and within a few seconds produce a new forecast, that would enable you know, more up-to-date weather forecasts uh, able to uh, uh, respond to changing conditions and so on. Next. Um, and one of the nice things about uh, this approach is the actual observations you have at, a, at, at time t can be the input, and then the observations that you have at time t plus one can be the target for what your machine learning model is trying to predict. And so you can essentially use the Earth itself as your training data uh, generator. Next. And this actually works quite well. You know, we're actually able to produce um, higher quality forecasts than the state of the art uh, numerical approaches, which are the, uh, the numerical approaches are the sort of blue line at the top there and the red line at the bottom is the machine learning based approach. Next. And in, in particular, even for forecasting up to 12 hours ahead, we can do much more fine grained prediction of, you know, where is precipitation going to happen and so on. Next. Uh, use of machine learning for uh, medicine and healthcare related applications is also uh, increasing. Um, and in particular, the general advancements in, uh, uh, you know, computer vision have also led to the ability to uh, apply these approaches to a wide variety of medical imaging tasks, you know, things like looking at uh, retinal images to detect diabetic retinopathy or looking at mammograms for breast cancer detection, uh, skin disease uh, detection through imagery and uh, cancer metastases from pathology slides. Uh, these are all pretty interesting and exciting and that covers a range of 2D images and 3D images and single view versus many view kind of uh, approaches. Next. And one of the things we've been pushing is uh, taking some of these uh, research works that we've published, but also working with partners to get them out into the world and actually um, sort of apply them to, um, you know, uh, giving giving actionable healthcare information for real people. So our diabetic retinopathy work has been deployed in India and Thailand, as well as France and Germany. And we're working with partners around the world to do that. We're working on making a dermatology-based uh, system uh, using the camera of viewfinder available uh, uh, externally as well. Um, next. And obviously healthcare is an incredibly important, but also, uh, you know, one, an area where you need to be uh, extremely careful in how you roll these things out. And so, you know, it's exciting. AI is learning to read mammograms, took a test to detect lung cancer and got an A, but if AI and healthcare goes wrong, who's responsible? There's a lot of interesting questions in how do we make sure that the systems we deploy are, are safe and reliable and are actually helping clinicians and helping uh, real people with uh, getting better answers to their health questions. Next. And so that brings me to the fifth trend, which is a deeper and broader understanding of machine learning. Next. So one of the things that we've been, uh, you know, as we've seen increasing use of machine learning throughout our products and throughout the world, um, we wanted to come up with a set of principles by which we evaluate which, uh, which uses of machine learning would we pursue and in what way. And so in, in mid-2018, we published a set of principles by which we think about these issues. You know, for all of the applications of machine learning, we want to make sure that they're socially beneficial, that they avoid uh, sort of reinforcing unfair bias, that they're safe, and, and so so forth. And these are really important principles. We evaluate all uses of machine learning against these principles when we when we launch things. Um, next, but I will also point out that they are sort of active areas of research in the machine learning research community. You know, we have some techniques for sort of eliminating unfair bias in our models, but those that's also an area of you know active research and the 
uh, sort of state of the art is advancing in that space. So we want to sort of use the best known techniques as we use machine learning, but also continue to advance the state of the art. Next. Um, as one example, you know, uh, gender bias in translation models can happen when you translate from a, a language without gendered pronouns to one with gendered pronouns. Um, the, the model must make a choice of, you know, what, what gender is it going to use for the word doctor? And, you know, it, unfortunately, the training data in the world tends to be biased towards thinking that doctors are males. And one of the things we've been doing is working to make sure our translation system, instead of just generating a male-only translation, actually generates both versions of the translation and enables users to pick and realize that there is a choice to be made here. Um, and we've been able to sort of reduce bias substantially with some better approaches for train getting more balanced training data. Next. Uh, we've also been working on tools that enable us to better understand uh, language models and what kinds of examples do these models perform poorly on, why do they make different kinds of predictions or, or completions, um, does it consistently behave if you change things like textual style and so on. And so there's some nice uh, visual tools that enable people to understand these sorts of models better. Next. So there are lots of exciting trends. This is a short talk, so I didn't have uh, time to cover lots and lots of other exciting work. But I think uh, what we're seeing is increased use of machine learning in a wide variety of different kinds of uh, both product settings as well as sort of advancing the state of the art in research. And it's really changing how we're thinking about building computing hardware, you know, how we think about how we can interact with computers. And that, that's really an exciting uh, area. Next. So uh, tremendous opportunities, I would say, but also there's a lot of responsibility in thinking about how we apply these uh, techniques to problems in society. And with that, I will turn it back over. Thank you very much. Fascinating. Thanks a lot, Jeff. This was really inspiring. We'll see you again in a bit in the Q&A session. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Royal Hansen. Royal is Google's Global Vice President of Privacy and Safety and Security, where he is responsible for driving the strategy and the implementation in these areas across the company's technical infrastructure and product lines, including to keep all your Google accounts safe and secure. Royal also has various teams here in, in Munich, working within the Google Safety Engineering Center. So it's a great pleasure to hear from you, Royale, what keeps you busy and what your organization is working on these days. So thanks for joining us and over to you, Royal. Thanks, Vilen, and I'll see you in a few weeks. We, uh, I'll be in Munich in, in three weeks. I'm reminded as I see a lot of Bavarian blue, uh, Jeff even uh, must have gotten the memo on his shirt. It, it's perfectly uh, designed. I have a tomb uh, hoodie and sweatshirt from the team there. So I uh, have really enjoyed the team in Munich and, and getting to know folks and we'll look ho hopefully forward to meeting some of you in person in coming years. I'm, I have, um, well, let's stay there for one second on the first slide. Um, I just wanted to frame a little bit of our work in the context of security and privacy. And then I have four or five slides that are in a way analogous to what Jeff's talked about. We are the, you know, we're on that front line of defending Google products, but we have a research team um, which works very closely with Jeff on a lot of the things you've just talked about, Jeff's team broadly. So I've tried to sort of weave the security and privacy narrative into it. But before we do that, let me just talk a little bit to what Vilan was describing. Um, we, uh, you know, like, like all of you, I mean, I wake up each day thinking about Ukraine and what's going on uh, in, in the war. And it, just for a second on the, you know, it's clearly important in Munich, in Eastern Central Europe for humanitarian reasons. But if you think about the cybersecurity questions that have been that have emerged, it really frames a lot of this work. It's not just about what happens behind the scenes. You now see that whether it's disinformation related or whether it's you see uh, news of potentially satellites being hacked as part of the war you see um, ransomware gangs preying on the fact that the war exists. Um, you see power grids uh, attacked or sort of threatened to be attacked. And I just, to, to me, it reminds me why I, I like this intersection of relationships with academia, research, product, and the real world. 
Because what we're doing is we innovate in all these areas and we create conveniences and, and, and improve the uh, life. We also, with that new technology, need to think about the ways in which security, privacy, and safety are brought to bear. Jeff talked a bit about it in his sort of that last seg segment, but I think I'll talk more about it in the context of the sort of classic cybersecurity, but also privacy. And it's really why we're in Munich in many ways. We think it's a great talent pool. We think it's a great place for the, the kind of questions that are being raised. And so um, I'm really grateful to be here today. I hope we can have a few questions as we go in that, that uh, anything that's on your mind in that relationship between the two. Um, just two, two other quick things to notice. We, I run a group called the Threat Analysis Group. It's in our team, and it's TAG you'll sometimes see, which uh, looks at um, the nation state attackers. And so we were actually up the rate of our reporting in the recent uh, uh, war in U Ukraine because we've seen a lot more activity around that. We have also, and I think there's another interesting way in which the innovation from Google or from, and whether that's from the security and privacy team or whether it's from research or other parts, made those products available to the world in, in a variety of ways. There's a project called Project Shield, which is based on the denial of service defenses that we developed at Google many years ago and now have a free version that's available and being used in over 100 government and public sector sort of uh, uh, utility type sites in Ukraine to defend them during uh, the war. So just as examples, I, I think you can see how everything goes from an academic world to the research and applied research right into our products. And that's one of the things I love about being at Google is there's billions of users of these products, whether it's for multi-factor authentication, uh, whether it's defending you against phishing in Gmail or anything you'll, you've heard Jeff talk about the, that I'm gonna talk about in just a second here. So with that, that's the background, and I'm happy to talk about any of that. Here, here are four or five examples, you can go to the next slide, of where we're working right on that front line of research and security, privacy, and safety. Most of them are related to machine learning, although as I was watching Jeff go through that hardware section, I'm reminded that we also have a team that works very closely with the hardware teams at Google, on that specialized work because the security issues in hardware, as we all know, are every bit as interesting as anything. And actually one of the examples touches on, on that. Um, in 2016, uh, uh, it was actually out of the research organization, they published and developed this stochastic gradient descent algorithm, DPSGD, which is you're sort of getting the picture, this, the amount of data and the accuracy or the, the amount of data that you can run through these models really helps determine the quality of what comes out. But also the sensitivity of the data uh, is, you know, it isn't accounted for when you start down that road. So this algorithm uh, allowed us to apply differential privacy uh, techniques. And there's a variety of ways of doing this. And it would reduce the likelihood that anything private was revealed through that process. Problem is the uh, uh, the speed and the amount of data you could run through it because of exactly what Jeff talked about in the machine, the uh, um, hardware required for it, what wasn't as good as it could be. Um, we, uh, in February, we could distribute these things with the Columbia researcher, uh, Professor Roxana Jambasu, have just um, boosted those speed and training accuracy uh, and accuracy for the SGD algorithm. Um, I think it's exactly the kind of work that we do is we make those algorithms more performant and differentially private. They're allowed to be applied to a much, much broader range of problems. As, as Jeff was talking about healthcare, you can think about not only the safety, but the privacy of information involved. Um, we've published the source code so people can look at it. And we've also done it so people can start to innovate on top of that. The idea is um, make uh, it as safe to do uh, training on private data as on uh, uh, data which you just get natively from the from signals. Next slide. 
In a similar vein, if there's a pipeline DP, if people know Open Mind, M I N E D, there's an organization dedicated to, to trying to help people ask and answer questions based on all the incredible data sets around the world, but a lot of them are sensitive or proprietary. And so their mission is to try and combine those two and help people answer questions. Clearly at the center of that is this question of differential privacy. So Pipeline DB uh, is an initiative that allows Python developers to basically do what I just described, differential private, differential privacy work on large data sets. We're using Apache Spark, uh, Apache Beam, and others. It's a good example of where, as Velan said, the GSEC, Google Safety Engineering Center in Munich, uh, runs code labs. And I think that you know, available to people broadly in the in, you know, online at this point, but certainly targeted at Munich and involved in that community. Um, the, again, the whole idea is to keep providing foundational tools and capabilities that allow these innovations in ML and, and other areas to be done safely, securely, privately uh, in all kinds of uh, uh, industries. Then let me switch gears a second to security, the next slide. As you were looking at that large and innovative hardware, the one of the classic problems with hardware and even with some software where it's dependent on constant time or, or speed um, algorithms is even if everything's done perfectly in the algorithm, you can still attack it, hack it, whatever you want to think about. These are the, the idea of side channel attacks because power or timing vary uh, based on what's being run through the, the, the hardware or software. So, if, if people are familiar with fuzzing, which is in the software world, it was the automation of the kind of work that uh, a, a, a software engineer, a security software engineer would do, where they would try all kinds of input to see when a piece of software would break. And that would be then they'd want to defend against that kind of attack. The same is true here in, in hardware or certain kinds of software, where you need to run all kinds of... Uh, um, uh, data and computational instructions through the hardware to figure out where a side channel attack might be possible. And so what we've developed is this is a SCAML. This is a um, side channel uh, attack uh, assisted with ML. You can see the, the acronym. It allows you to collect signal data from hardware. The, the, the think of this as like um, um, power or uh, electromagnetic signal and then move it into the world that, like Jeff described, an ML problem. So you're taking that signal instead of it. So like fuzzing, you're modeling with large amounts of data the way the system will perform and looking for those points at which it's leaking information because of its power properties or its, you know, its, its signal properties. Again, same idea. This is something we, we looked at how you might recover cryptographic key material because it's interesting to a security team. Um, but this, it could be used in a variety of ways. Again, we've published that information, the source code, so people can start to play with it and expand it. It's, it's early stage. It's used on maybe more modestly protected um, hardware and software. But the idea is to now make it more, you know, we're working on more advanced um, uh, implementations. Next slide. Uh, so security, privacy, we talk about safety, and that can mean a lot of things. But in this context, I was talking with Alex Stamos, who is over at Stanford and works in this intersection of safety and security. Think of safety in this context as abuse of the system as designed. Security, oftentimes, we're, we're sort of subverting the system. Think of safety or trust and safety. You're using the system as designed, but you're abusing it. So as, as you might imagine, through whether it's looking at phishing or malware that comes through Gmail Drive, think about the billions of uh, users and messages we process. I have, a, I have a, an enormous amount of data and analysis that goes into the, to building protections. You'll see later this year, some of that analysis at the uh, Enigma conference, and then in the Oakland conference that both um, uh, 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 Usenix related, it's, um, I would say it's a harder space though than the others because in part, back to this question of privacy, at-risk populations or very personal related information is harder to collect 
in a way that you would feel comfortable doing research on. So we are working on that. Um, think about something like Virus Total, which is a, a, a you know well-known collection of malware samples. It's actually the sister GSEC in Europe, in, in Spain. And we would welcome and love to do more work on how we could look at things like misinformation or uh, sort of the more nuanced at-risk populations in different countries or different industries to think about ways to still do research, publish it, help the community, but not reveal the sensitive information that is obviously involved in once you get into the more semantics of, uh, of misinformation. The last slide is um, one that, you know, I, people have worked on for a long time, open source security, but I think time has, has really come. As you saw last year with the Log4j vulnerability and just one of the most widely used uh, Java libraries, and then before that with um, SolarWinds, the attack on a variety of US government agencies, and both of which were at our heart vulnerabilities in an open source piece of software. Now we all rely on open source software. It's sort of embedded in almost everything Google does. Um, it's our strategy in many ways. Think of things like the TensorFlow work. Um, we founded last year with a few other partners, this open source security foundation under the Linux uh, uh, foundation, the Apache foundation, and um, committed $100 million to, to really the, getting started at how we can fix security vulnerabilities. Um, we work with GitHub on the in a, some, it, uh, let's call them iterations on improvements to having scorecards published for open source libraries. Uh, and then we use our open source fuzzing infrastructure. So this is again, where we've published our fuzzing tools to help open source products use them to find their vulnerabilities. It's called OSS fuzz. I raise it because it's just a, it's a great place for collaboration across industry and uh, academia. We all depend on this and it's not a, you know, there's a bit of a, Problem of the the sort of the problem of the commons or the almost a political science problem here, in how do we maintain these open source libraries at a secure level and still keep them open source? So lots of work there. You can see the pointers. Hopefully that gives you a taste for how we're working at that intersection of security, safety, and privacy, alongside the kind of more more fundamental research topics that you heard from Jeff or other parts of the products at Google. I look forward to some questions. Thank you, Roy, so much. And thank you, Jeff, for these insightful presentations about Google Research and the work that you do. My name is Liz Bauer. I enable research partnerships across Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. And I would like to initiate the Q&A session with students now. And we really received some great questions from students from TU Munich beforehand. Um, so I would like to invite the first question from Daniel Scholz. Daniel, if you're there, um, can you unmute yourself and would you like to ask your question live? Uh, yes, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so my question is, um, how do I prepare for the future of AI and machine learning? And how do I keep up with the fast development in the research field? as Jeff also showed before. Yeah, maybe I'll take this one. It's a, it's a very good question, because I think um, the, the rate of publish, publishing in this field and the amount of research that's coming out in machine learning is growing uh, tremendously. I think I looked at one point at the number of sort of machine learning papers on archive. Uh, and in 2011, that was about 1,000 per year. And now it's well above 100,000 papers per year. So first, don't feel bad. You can't keep up with all of it. Uh, that's that's uh, the first uh, sort of realistic assessment. Uh, I think it's also important to find some areas you are excited about and pay more attention to those, but also kind of have a vague sense of what's going on in some adjacent areas. And one of the one of the ways I sort of tell people to do that is um, 
in, in many cases, you do need to read a paper very deeply and understand every last detail if it's highly related to something you're doing. But in a lot of cases, it's probably a better use of time to kind of skim 10 papers and get a sense of what they're doing rather than read those, uh, you know, one paper very deeply. And it might even be better to sort of read 100 abstracts of papers to get, because what you're trying to do is get a sense of what's possible and getting a bunch of points of sort of uh, evidence or, or things that are, are possible or the areas that people are looking at is a much uh, better way to build out a broad set of how to sort of approach problems because you can sort of say, oh yeah, if I combine these three ideas, you can always go back and read a paper in much more detail, but you wanna kind of have this constellation of ideas that others in the world have generated so that you can use that as your own building blocks. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, elaborate answer. All right. So with that, we'd like to move to the second question, which has been submitted by Jan Philipp Schulze. Jan? Hi, uh, thank you for a nice talk. I was wondering, is there always a security expert involved when designing new Google products? So for example, when there's new AI out there, is there someone protecting it against potential adversary attacks? Great, I'll, I'll take that. And, and although we do, Jeff does have people in his team that do this too. So it's interesting that, that, that that's the strategy. So our central organization, it called PSS, Privacy, Safety and Security, is about 3,000 people. And we work on kind of common problems that are common to all of Google or thinking holistically about Google. But to your question, Chrome, Android, cloud, research, all have and this has just developed over the 20 some odd years at Google, specialized security, privacy, safety teams that are, think of it like a hub and spoke, work with the central teams on common topics and approaches, but they are embedded. Uh, you don't write, you know, think of like um, Chrome OS, very, into, you know, security is just critical to that. So we embed security and privacy locally in product areas, but have a coordinated approach to things like fuzzing or um, our, our network uh, storage, think of common capabilities centrally. So it's foundational, it's not done after the fact. Thanks, this gives me a good feeling. <laughs> All right, thank you. And with that, we'd like to move to the third question, which has been submitted by Viviana Sudecu. Thanks for the intro. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Royal. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm studying informatics and medicine, so I'm wondering what kind of general areas does Google Health specifically focus on and what kind of skill sets are required? Uh, specifically, how do medical staff and computer science researchers work together at Health? Yeah, great to meet you, Viviana, and a uh, very good question. Um, you know, I think uh, if you're interested in detail in, in the Google Research Publications page, there's a health and bioscience subsection. And you can see kind of the broad list of, of papers. We've got about 200 papers uh, published there. But broadly, we focus on uh, a number of different areas. So one is sort of uh, how can we build diagnostic techniques using machine learning and AI that can help improve the ability of clinicians to sort of better diagnose, better detect disease in lots of different kind of forms. Uh, so I, I showed some of them on the in the slide in the talk. Uh, we also have a pretty active uh, 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 group that looks at genomic related information and how can we use machine learning and AI to sort of, uh, sort of deal with both the raw data that comes off genomic sequencing machines, how can we sort of better uh, reduce noise in those measurements uh, and then use that information for predicting things. We have a bunch of more uh, bioscience related work where we're uh, looking at uh, how do we analyze protein structure and things like that. And then we also have some more applied product focused work where we're trying to build products that enable uh, clinicians to better understand um, sort of the state a patient is in given their medical record and other things and give clinicians, you know, very quick uh, access and information about what is going on with this patient because you know doctors are very busy and they often have 10 minutes to prepare for seeing a patient and they have you know 100 pages of information in a medical record they really want to understand 
what is going on with this patient that I'm that I'm now seeing. And so we're trying to build tools that enable clinicians to do that. Um, so it's really a whole range of things. And the way in which we have sort of uh, doctors and other medical professionals working with our teams is we really embed them in the same team. And so the, the clinicians are really giving feedback about, you know, what kinds of things would be useful or is this algorithm actually giving me a useful insight? We have uh, doctors and clinicians labeling data for some kinds of the medical imaging diagnostics work, uh, but they're really kind of lots of different skills that are needed. And I, I think one of the most, most, a lot of the most interesting projects I've ever worked on are ones where you bring together people with very different kinds of expertise and you all work together on something that none of you could do individually uh, because you know, it's a collective uh, achievement in that way. And also some of their knowledge rubs off on you and some of your knowledge rubs off on them. And then maybe you continue working together, maybe you go your separate ways, but now you've got a broader set of skills in which to, to build on. So thank you for the question. Thanks so much. Sounds really exciting. Great question, Viviana. Thank you. Um, so with that, we'd like to move to the last question for today, which has been submitted by Valentin Siegelmeier. Thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Royal and Jeff, for these great talks. I'm really honored to be able to meet you. And actually, I love this idea of interdisciplinary research, uh, Jeff, which, because I'm doing that in a different field. I'm doing it actually in privacy. This is why my question is related to privacy as well. Um, so it's more to Royal, maybe. I'm wondering, is there maybe a conflict of interest uh, for the researchers at Google when it comes to privacy research? Because I'm thinking the ideal of privacy would kind of be opposed to the business model of Google, at least it seems to me. So I'm wondering, are the researchers really free to present and publish solutions that actually might question or endanger your business model when it comes to, to privacy? Um, it, you know, thanks for the question and, and not the first time we've heard it, uh, as you might expect. Um, look, I, you've heard today, and in, in many ways, you've just described the, the rationale for the expertise that we developed and work on. And I think I, I would just say Jeff's team has every bit the um, expertise and interests in making data useful broadly um, and safely that our team does. I don't find that it, it, it's not a us or them dynamic at Google. It's, and you even saw that in that open mind example, really everyone's pretty clearly aligned around the idea that if we can use data safely, there's all kinds of interesting things we can do, including some of the things related to the specifically the business model. I mean, you've even seen our recently the third party cookie deprecation work is a good example of continuing to innovate in those areas. So there's no ambiguity around sort of the direction of travel. It's really an opportunity for this intersection of data, technology, security. How do we do that well for society? So I've I've found nothing but um, alignment there, but acknowledging the tensions uh, in society at large. I don't think those are unique to, ju to Google. Yeah, maybe I can just add a little bit. I mean, I think uh, clearly we want to publish interesting privacy research, and we, and we do. So, for example, Google researchers uh, five or six years ago published a paper about federated learning, which is a technique for learning machine learning models where the data never leaves uh, sort of a safe domain like someone's uh, phone or uh, other sort of, uh, you know, um, encapsulated area, but where you can actually learn in a, in a privacy preserving way, interesting models that enable people to benefit from the uh, sort of collective behavior of others while preserving privacy. And I think these are the kinds of things that, that we definitely uh, want to do more of, and we've actually, you know, use that in our products. So, for example, the Android keyboard swipe model when you're typing words, you know, new words enter the vocabulary all the time, and you don't want to rely on each individual user to have to type a new word before the model learns from that. You want to learn from the collective behavior, but obviously sending everyone's keystrokes to a centralized uh, place would obviously be, you know, invasive of privacy. So I, I think, you know, there are lots of you know, communal benefits you can get from aggregated behavior that still are, are privacy friendly and, and uh, preserving of privacy. Great answers, thank you guys. Actually, I, I, I fully believe you and I, I see that there's a way forward that kind of connects privacy and, and business. I don't think it's impossible and it gives me hope the way that you think about these problems, so thank you. Okay. 
very important topics we touched upon and uh, very good questions submitted by all the students. Um, we do not have more time for these, unfortunately, now. Um, but I would like to thank everybody for their participation, for the great presentations. And um, as we are moving into the more individual Q&A sessions, we're concluding this for today. Thank you so much and um, hope to see you all soon. Thank you all.